I'd like to uh, talk to you this afternoon about the very uh, difficult and sensitive subject of what happens to a baby or a person who is mentally incapable to understand the gospel, what happens to them when they die. And uh, I want to address this issue for a number of reasons. And the first is, since we're studying what is Reformed theology, frequently an objection is raised when discussing predestination. And uh, it, it is a very emotionally charged uh, kind of discussion, but it often goes like this. I heard that Calvin or Calvinists teach that God predestines babies to hell. And uh, since we're taking up common objections to the Reformed faith, we'll address this. Um, there's a second reason why I'd like to address it, and that is a number of months ago, we had a, a teens and 20 gathering at, um, at the Berlich home, and uh, we, had, we had a bunch of our young people there, and one of the questions, uh, we had a question and answer time, and one of the questions they asked had to do with um, what happens to babies when they die. And uh, we addressed it a little there, but uh, I believe that it's one of those questions that really does deserve uh, more uh, treatment and, uh, and better understanding. And then third, the reason I'd like to take this up is because it's obviously a, uh, a pastoral issue. It's tremendously pastoral. It is a personal issue, uh, one that needs to be addressed uh, biblically and yet with sensitivity. Um, many, even many here maybe, have lost children through a miscarriage. Uh, others have lost children in infancy or early childhood. Um, I remember growing up, um, my, uh, my dad uh, had an older brother uh, whose name was uh, Little Herbie, but he died at, uh, at two years old. And then he had a younger sister who, uh, who died before she even came home from the hospital. And all through my years growing up, um, I saw my grandmother's heavy, heavy heart for the two children that she had lost. And, uh, and so it's one of those things that does, does deeply affect us. Also, the fact is, is that others have, have lost, a child, lost children through abortion. And one of the things that um, people that struggle with uh, abortion struggle with is what happened to that baby uh, that I took its life. Um, other children are born mentally handicapped and cannot actually understand issues of law and sin and grace and the gospel. And, uh, and so this applies to them. And so when I say infants, think not only of, of actual infants, but also those who have mental incapacities that would preclude them from actually uh, understanding and responding to the gospel. Now, for some of you, when you heard uh, this would be the afternoon sermon, you might have just said, well, of course babies go to heaven when they die. Everybody knows that. And um, the question is, what is the rationale for thinking such a thing? There are many common views about uh, what happens to infants, and uh, the first is that there is this age of accountability, and that if a person dies before they reach an age of accountability, then they die in a state of innocence, and then on the basis of that innocence, they obviously go to heaven. And uh, I would say that when dealing with what happens to babies when they die, uh, the age of accountability argument ends up being probably the most predominant one. But I will tell you that the idea of age of accountability and age of innocence is actually a Pelagian idea that, is, that, that completely ignores the concept of original sin. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that um, by the way, just as a side note, I was preaching in Louisiana one time, and, and uh, the pastor there wanted me to do a question and answer time after every sermon, and I preached nine times that week. And, um, and after one of the, the sermons, I, I quickly learned that none of the questions would be related to what I had just preached on. And um, uh, as soon as I was done preaching, this guy raised his hand, and he said, what's the age of accountability? which is somewhat difficult if you don't, to answer if you don't believe in an age of accountability. And so I told him that I didn't think that there was such a thing. 
And uh, he got uh, pretty grumpy with me right away and informed me that the Bible taught uh, that the age of accountability was 20. And um, I, of course, I was curious to know how in the world he came up with 20. And his answer was that, um, that all of the uh, Israelites that left Egypt, it was only those that were under the age of 20 who were allowed to enter into the promised land. And when I, when I actually made the point that the, the reason it was the age 20 was because that was the age of war, and that generation was unwilling to go into the promised land, and that it was those that, that, that were not morally culpable for taking up the responsibility of, of war, that that's why it was 20, um, he, he got grumped up even more and, and just decided to leave. So I understand this is an incredibly um, emotional issue for people. Um, there's another view, and this is, this is probably a pretty common evangelical view, and it's just a sentimentality view. It just, it goes, it's, it's this simple. God is love, and obviously he wouldn't send a baby to hell. And, uh, and so, of course, because God is love, all babies must go to heaven. And uh, let me just say that that's... That's not how we do theology either. We, we, we don't try to determine these things on the basis of how we feel about them. Um, I mean, if, if that was the way we determined all theology, then we would end up becoming universalists. We would end up denying the justice of God and the holiness of God and the wrath of God altogether. And so uh, sentimentality doesn't actually answer any theological question. Uh, the, the minute that sentimentality about what God is or must be according to your own sentiments, uh, as soon as that becomes the answer, then you're probably um, in just incredibly wrong because God's not like us. There's another position that says basically this, all, ev- all infants who die in infancy are elect. And um, interesting, uh, saw this weekend reading, uh, Ulrich Zwingli actually taught that Uh, death in infancy was a sign of election. Uh, Others have taught that children of believers are elect, but children of unbelievers, who knows? Um, Others, not very many, but uh, Peter Martyr Vermigli among the Reformers is one, taught that some infants are elect, some infants are reprobate, and that's just the way that it is. Other views have said, well, baptized infants go to heaven, Unbaptized infants don't. There are different variations of that view. Um, Others have said children of believers go to heaven, children of unbelievers do not. And then there is just the agnostic view expressed by Francis Turretin, who said this, although Christian charity commands us to cherish a good hope concerning their salvation, still we cannot certainly determine that every single one belongs to the election of God but leave it to the secret counsel and supreme liberty of God. Now, I'm going to give you four truths to consider, then we'll look at the proposition, and then I'll try to make my case. The first is this. One, the Bible does not teach us an age of accountability that is preceded by a state of innocence, all right? Uh, The Bible does teach us uh, an age of moral awareness, And uh, the Bible, and you can see that, I have the text there for you. There is a sense in which the Bible uh, recognizes that there's a period that we're not morally aware of certain things, and then we become morally aware. Classic text, Romans 7, 7 to 10, Paul didn't know about coveting until what? Until the law came to him and said, you shall not covet. And once the law came to him, sin came alive, and then he died. And uh, that's a sense of moral awareness. Um, Other passages that deal with moral awareness uh, talk about uh, knowing your left hand from your right hand, and that is the idea of having some sort of moral compass. And and there is a sense in which moral responsibility or culpability is tied to moral awareness, but make no mistake, the Bible does not give us a sense that there is somehow innocence, and then once you reach a a, a certain age, then you're responsible. That's not the way the Bible teaches. The second uh, truth we have to consider is the biblical doctrine of original sin teaches us that every human being is conceived and born in sin because of Adam. And so David says in Psalm 51.5, in sin my mother conceived me. The idea is is that at the very moment of conception we're conceived as sinners. 
the wicked go astray from birth, (laughs) speaking lies. And so there's a sense in which we come into this world as sinners. Uh, Of course, Paul tells us very clearly in Romans 5.12 that sin entered into this world through one man and death through sin. And the fact that infants even die is a clear demonstration that they are partakers of Adam's sin. And so the Bible would actually teach us that all of us are born in sin because of Adam. Thirdly, the Bible also teaches us very, very clearly that anyone who's saved is saved only by the electing grace of God and the application of Christ's work, granting them forgiveness of sins and the imputation of Christ's righteousness. The Bible is absolutely clear that there's only one way a person's going to get into heaven. And it's not because of some concept of inherent innocence. There's only one way a person's going to get into heaven, and that is by the electing grace of God by which the benefits of Christ's work are given to their account, and their sins are forgiven, and they are imputed with Christ's righteousness. And here's the fourth thing to consider before we jump into this. The Bible does not explicitly address this subject. I wish it did. But we don't get to pick what God addressed and what he... It's not like he had a suggestion box when he was inspiring Scripture. He, he, there, is, there is no explicit text that deals with this subject. And so that should cause us to be cautious. Um, some of the resources that I have listed for you in the back, um, I think, uh, follow that, that line of being cautious... Others are a little less cautious, a little more dogmatic. But I would say that that we ought to uh, immediately be careful when Scripture does not actually give us a clear-cut course for understanding something. That being said, we can go to Scripture and draw good inferences and implications that apply to this situation. In other words, just because Scripture doesn't explicitly address this issue does not mean that we have to actually take the agnostic view like Turretin and others who just say, we just don't know. I think that we can go to Scripture and look at principles and look at texts and draw inferences and say, this is is building a, a good case that is persuasive And although I can't be as dogmatic about this as I would, let's say, the deity of Christ or the substitutionary atonement, I think it can give us good hope. And here's the proposition for you. All infants who die in infancy or young childhood are elect and have the benefits of Christ's merits graciously applied to them and go to heaven by the sovereign grace of God in Jesus Christ. That's, um, that's what I believe. And um, I was very happy last night to find out that according to Benjamin B. Warfield, uh, this has become the predominant view among the Reformed, at least within the last 100 years. Now, that doesn't mean a whole lot. What ultimately matters is what the Bible says, what the Bible implies, what we can infer from, uh, from uh, the Scriptures. And so let's go ahead and, and try to do that. And uh, I'm going to start where you, would, you might think I'd start, and that is in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. You will remember that 2 Samuel 11 and 12 is really one of the darkest periods, or the darkest period of David's life. Chapter 11 records for us his notorious sin with Bathsheba. You will remember that not only is David guilty of adultery, wife stealing, he is also guilty once he finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant. He is guilty of of trying to cover his sin. And through two two failed uh, plans to cover his sin, he finally um, is guilty of the sin of murder and is responsible for the death of Uriah the Hittite. David goes on in his sin, and uh, Bathsheba gets bigger and bigger and bigger. uh, Nathan the prophet comes, 
rebukes David, David repents, and the baby is born. When the baby is born, the baby is sick. And God actually tells David that this is part of the consequence of his sin. And uh, while the baby is sick, David is fasting and he's praying and, uh, and he looks absolutely terrible. The, his servants are concerned uh, about him. And we read in verse uh, 18, Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead, since he might do himself harm? But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, and he came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you've done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live, but now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Now, there there are a couple of things about this passage that we should keep in mind. And the first is that some Old Testament scholars say that the only thing that David is saying here is that the baby died and went to the grave, that is to Sheol, and that one day David would die and he too would go to Sheol. In other words, the baby's dead and one day David would be dead and uh, and that's all that David is saying when he said, the baby can't come to me but one day I will go to him. The thing about that explanation is that it seems to actually lack the ability to explain how David was comforted in this process. To simply say, the baby died, I'm going to die, doesn't seem to be a real consoling truth. What does seem to be a consoling truth is, the child died and one day I will be reunited with him. And it was that that gave David the comfort to get up, to wash, to eat, and to go and worship God. In other words, he had the, uh, the confidence that one day he would see that child. Now, this is not, as I said, this is not uh, the text in the argument, but I do think that it is a piece of the puzzle that we need to seriously consider. The second passage I'd like you to look at is Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Chapter 19. Verse 13. Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the children alone, do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And after laying hands on them, he departed from there. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to consider these two texts. 
In the first one, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus actually uses children as the model for conversion. If you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, you have to become like a child because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And then explicitly in the Matthew 19 passage, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven belongs to children. And so here here is what I would say. Neither one of these texts, again, are explicit, but wouldn't it seem strange to you to exclude from the kingdom of heaven the very ones who serve as models for entering the kingdom of heaven and who characterize the kingdom of heaven itself. It's interesting to me that Jesus would use children as the model and then say children characterize the kingdom and then turn around and say, but, but not all children go there. And so again, by way of inference, I would say that because of the way Jesus uses children, in reference to the kingdom of heaven, entering it and characterizing it, that it is is a good inference to say that they go to heaven. The third argument, and this is the one that's going to require you to, to think a little bit, and that is the principle of judgment. The principle of judgment. In the Bible... And I I would say without fear of any kind of contradiction or qualification, in the Bible, every single passage that deals with final judgment, final judgment is always, without exception, on the basis of works and deeds and sins. Go through every text that deals with judgment, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, and people are judged according to their works. They're judged according to their sins. Now, this is where you need to follow closely. Although the infant is not innocent, but rather fallen in Adam, when they die in infancy, they have not yet sinned in a way that is personally and morally culpable according to the principles of divine judgment. Let me read to you from an entire book that's dedicated to this subject, The Theology of Infant Salvation by Robert Webb. Webb says this, he says, Dead infants have been prevented by the providence of God from committing any responsible deeds of any sort in the body, And consequently, infants are not damned upon these principles or premises. There is no account in Scripture of any other judgment based on any other grounds. I think, therefore, that a study of the final judgment entitles us to infer that actual condemnation is always predicated upon actual sins. Original sin renders all the race, adults and infants, damnable, but the judgment scene shows us that damnability is converted into damnation only upon the ground of actual personal conscious sins, a kind of sin which no infant dying in infancy could commit. So if you think about it this way, original sin in Adam has a number of effects. Original sin in Adam makes us all legal sinners. That is, Adam's sin is imputed to our account. Also in Adam, we become natural born sinners. In other words, we sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. And so we have imputation and nature because of the sin of Adam. If you read carefully Romans 5, what you see is that Adam's sin results in condemnation to the whole human race. And that condemnation is made up of death and being made a sinner, Romans 5.19. So all of us come into the world standing guilty in Adam. What happens because of original sin, as we grow and mature, we become sinners by choice who bring forth the fruit of our nature in actual deeds, all right? As you look at the passages that deal with divine judgment, the only basis of divine judgment is not the imputed sin of Adam 
or even a fallen human nature, but rather actual deeds committed consciously against God. And so, elect infants may die in infancy, and they go to heaven. Being elect, the uh, uh, infant is a beneficiary of the atonement and regenerating grace which are necessary for anyone to enter into heaven. Although the infant cannot repent and believe, repentance and faith are instruments of salvation, not the grounds of salvation. And so repentance and faith are the conscious responses of a sinner who is consciously turning from their sin to Christ. Infants have no such consciousness, and this does not, therefore, negate their savability. Now, what about non-elect infants? Follow closely. Non-elect infants do not die in infancy but are rather allowed to come to maturity, at which time they can and do voluntary acts of sin against God. And it is these for which they are judged and are condemned. Fourth argument, the population and ethnicity, or if you will, multiculturalism of heaven. The population of heaven. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, what about the road that leads to life? It's narrow. And how many find it? Few. What is the road that leads to destruction? It's broad. And how many find it? Many. All right? So you've got few and many. In Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter uh, 13, someone says to Jesus, Lord, are there only a few who are going to be saved? And Jesus says, strive to enter the narrow gate. Again, underscoring what? Few are actually going to be those who go through the narrow gate, stay on the narrow way, and enter into heaven. The broad road is going to be chock full of people, and hell will be populated by those who walked that road and entered into that destiny. Now, here's the thing. And again, I understand that this is inference. How many people are actually going to be in heaven? John tells us in Revelation 7, it is a number that no man can count. It is innumerable. John sees a multitude that no man can number. Now, Spurgeon makes, a, 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 I think, a, what is a great point, and that is the reason why we know that there's only going to be a few who travel the narrow road that leads to life, and there's going to be a whole multitude that go on the broad road that leads to destruction, and yet at the end of the age there's going to be a multitude of redeemed that no man can number is because the, mul- the entire multitude of infants who have died in infancy will go to heaven and will actually populate heaven. In fact, Spurgeon, in in a very wonderful section in his sermon on infant salvation, says this. He says, I believe that the great part of the kingdom of heaven will be made up of children. I like that. The Lord Jesus loved children, didn't he? It is amazing to see our Lord's attitude towards children. The disciples were like most of us. Get these kids out of here. They're bothering us. Jesus says, no, you let them come to me. Children weren't afraid of the Lord Jesus. It says a lot when when Jesus would call one in into the midst and uh, call them to come to him. And in the midst of all these grown-ups, that child would come and approach the Lord Jesus. Could it be that what delights the Father's heart would be to have a kingdom that's made up, not like a bunch of old grumpy people like us, but actually made up for the most part of children? Think of the infant mortality rate throughout the ages, throughout the world, and you will realize that there are far, far, far more infants 
who have died uh, throughout the ages than we could ever even begin to imagine. Spurgeon says in his, in his own day that the infant mortality rate was one-third, and that, he said that's not even counting even nations. And so we don't know what it is, but we know that it will be a multitude that no man can number. That brings us up to, uh, to the next point, and that is this. Think about the ethnic makeup of heaven. Okay, when, when we get to heaven, okay, just, just kind of look around. This is not what heaven's going to look like. Okay? I mean, let's face it, like 90% of us in here, 95, are just ordinary old white people. Heaven is going to be radically different, okay? Heaven is actually going to uh, contain Revelation 5, 9, and 10 people from what? From every nation, tribe, tongue, and people group. John gives us four categories there, and he says the redeemed, those purchased with the blood of Christ, will be people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people group. And so that brings up another part of this argument, and that is this. There are nations, there are a multitude of nations in the past and in the present, and tongues and tribes who have never heard the gospel. They have never heard the name of Christ. In fact, not one living person among them has ever confessed Christ, and yet the ethnicity of heaven will include every tribe, nation, and tongue. And I simply ask, on the basis of knowing that we must consciously put faith in Christ, how in the world could we argue for every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, unless many of those were infants? I don't know if you caught it, and it's actually the whole reason we sang the hymn. Isaac Watts put it like this. He said, people and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest song, and infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name. So... There are many other people, and in fact, in the references that I have for you, um, there are many other arguments that are used. You can see there an essay from B.B. Warfield, which is actually very fascinating about the history of uh, infant salvation or the doctrine of it. A.A. A. Hodge, R.A. Webb, C.H. Spurgeon, R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, and so forth. And uh, those are further uh, resources with further arguments. And so... Um, a warning as we think about this. Do not use the devil's logic. And I mean the devil's logic. And say, well, if that is the case, then abortion is good because it gets more people to heaven. To say something that egregious is to be in the same category of those whom Paul denounces who said, let's sin so that grace may abound. To use the argument that children who die in infancy go to heaven is simply not any excuse for us to do anything else other than be vigorously pro-life in every area of our life. The second thing, and this is for our comfort, ultimately, when you think of these arguments, when you think of the other arguments that are used, what we are doing is we are ultimately appealing to the nature and the character of God. God is good. He's full of mercy. He is just. He is kind. These implications, one that is kind and tender towards children, one who holds morally accountable those who have consciously sinned against him, these implications give us a good hope that the God in whom we trust is the God whose dwelling place is actually filled with children who are constantly giving him praise. And so if you've lost a child, I would say that the Bible gives us a good, solid hope to believe that one day you can have the confidence, just like David did, 
That child won't come back to you, but one day you will go to him or to her. For those of you who have suffered and endured the the horrors of an abortion and you wonder what in the world would have become of that little one, you can take comfort and consolation to know that that child is safe in the arms of a loving God and one day you too will be reunited. And so I would hope that this would be a comfort and an encouragement to you. And the next time that somebody says to you, a Calvinist or Reformed theology teaches that God predestines babies to hell, um, you can tell them that, that's, uh, that that is generally not, not the case at all. And um, in fact, as B.B. Warfield points out, it is from the Reformed position that we really only have the only uh, biblical foundation for assuming that children do go to heaven. In all of the other systems, it, it requires unbiblical thinking. Here, how does a person get to heaven? By the free, sovereign grace of a merciful God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we certainly do want to tread carefully, but we also do not want to be uh, without understanding and without hope. And so we pray, Lord, that even today you would take these things and and use them to comfort your people. And we thank you, Father, that you do love children, and they are the blessing of the Lord. And we thank you for our children. We pray for those, Lord, who are growing and understand the issues of, of sin and and law and grace. And Father, we pray that in your sweet mercy, you would bring each one of our children to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his precious name. Amen.